Matthew 6. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew 6, from verses, I think from verses 19 to 20, 24. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth do corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mamma. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any thoughts on, on that passage? Amen. Amen. I think one, I mean, feel free anybody to interrupt, but one thing that um, that I think uh, God is trying to purge us from is idolatry. And um, this is something that prevents us from knowing God. And I think when it says no man can serve two masters, it's, it's literally any other thing apart from God. We can't serve God and money. We can't serve God and anything else, our job. We can't serve God, anything in this world. And I think what God is doing to his church is God is getting us to rely on him above all things. And God is getting us to trust in him above all other things as well. A scripture came to my heart earlier on about um, what what would what will you gain? Like what will it what will it profit you if a man gains the whole world and loses his own his own soul? So all the things in the world they cannot be compared to having God in our lives, walking with God. And I think one of the first commandments that God gave uh, Israel through Moses is that we should have no idols before Him. So God wants us to come back to our first love. I think in, in, um, in the book of Revelation, it says that we need to come back to, to Christ. We need to come back to our first love. And I think that's what God is doing through the church right now. He's, he's removing every single idol that we have, whether it's money, or whether it's our job, whether it's a relationship, whatever it may be, whatever's separating us from loving God and walking in our calling in, in Christ, it, it may be painful, but God is removing things from our lives gradually, day by day. And this is part of our sanctification. This is what we need to do uh, to, to become mature. This is what we need to do to enter into the kingdom of God. One of our main prayers as Christians is, uh, Father, can we get into the kingdom of God? You know, we say, we say, our Father, who in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. So we want to enter into God's kingdom. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The will of God is for all of us to enter into God's kingdom. As we're praying these type of prayers, God has to do a work on the inside of every single one of us so that we can enter him because we have to be blameless. That means we can't even have jealousy or like malice or envy or anger. We can't have any of those type of things uh, to enter into God's kingdom. So what God does is God, you know, he, does, he doesn't expect us to do it by ourselves. But God always helps us in the cause. Like God is never going to leave us. The Bible says he's not going to leave us nor forsake us. So, so long that we're always looking for him, so long that we're always hungry for him, so long we're always trying to please him by our heart, by making sure that our heart condition is right with God, then God is always going to ensure that his spirit will be with us. And the great thing about God is that God forgives us whenever we fall short. When we turn to God and confess our sin, God always forgives us. The Bible says that his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. So that means you, 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 you can't be disqualified from entering into God's presence because of something you did yesterday. You can always come back to God with a sorrowful heart, with a contrite heart. You can always repent and say, look, God, you know, the, the way that I spoke to this person was wrong. The way that I handled this situation was wrong. 
what I did last night, Lord, was wrong. I'm, I'm truly sorry. I don't want to do it again. Give me the strength to overcome this sin. Give me deliverance. And God will help us. You know, I was speaking to a, a brother earlier on, and he said to me that there are two types of Christians. Christians who, uh, who, who need deliverance and, and, and don't know, and Christians who are humble and, and uh, they, they discern that, look, they're not currently perfect. They're not currently mature there's certain things that they need help with and i'm i as i don't want to i don't want to brag but i would say that you know recently i've come to the realization that i'm second i'm definitely the second one i i know that there are areas where i need deliverance and i think that this is this is what we what god wants us to recognize in this season god wants us to come to him and say look lord i'm struggling in a particular area i'm struggling with my anger I'm, i get easily angered you know, Lord, I'm struggling with impatience. I need help being patient with, with you, with, my, with other people, even with myself, with my own growth. These are things that we need to ask God for. And this is what we have to be quite strategic with how we're praying. Now, let's, let's stop praying for things. Let's stop praying for money. Let's stop praying for clothes. This is what mm-hmm. the is saying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. saying. Stop seeking after the things of the world because the, the, the Gentiles have the things of this world. Uh, the, or the Gentiles look after the things of this world, they, uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things will be added unto you. Amen. That, that's Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Now, th- there's a passage, um, I think it's in Matthew. I'm not sure if it's Matthew 11, but it's a passage which says that that the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. I don't know where it is. Um, yeah. um, Matthew chapter 11, verses 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And so Christ is saying here that for us to... to get into the kingdom, into God's kingdom. We, we, we call it heaven, don't we? <laughs> we? We call the kingdom of God heaven. For us to get there, we have to be violent in a spiritual sense, not in a, in a physical sense, because he said that though we walk in the flesh, we war not after the flesh, for our weapons are not carnal. So they, our, our weapons are not physical. We don't fight people physically. That's why Christ told Peter, and Peter struck a man on his ear. Christ rebuked Peter and said, look, he that lives by the sword will die by the sword. Okay, so we don't war like the world wars, but we war spiritually. And there is, my friends, there is a common enemy for the saints. And that man or that spirit is, 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 is out there, to, the Bible says, to steal, to kill and to destroy. That is why the Bible says that we need to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Look, my brothers and sisters, us, by us coming to Bible study, by us fasting, by us praying, by us seeking the face of God, by us reading the word of God in our own time, these sacrifices will enable us with the grace of God for us to enter into the God, into God's kingdom. And what God is saying is like all these things in the world, they cannot be compared to what God is going to give us in his kingdom. So every single effort that we put in, every single tear that we shed, Every single sacrifice that we make, every single uh, meal that we've skipped is all going to be worth it. And the Bible says that our time on the earth is like a vapor. It is like a vapor. Our time on the earth, even if we live up to 70 or 80 years, it's very, very short in comparison to the, to the kingdom that God has given us. So my brothers and sisters, the Bible says in the book of Revelation, do not let anybody take your crown. That means that even people that Satan has sent to try and distract us, there are people that Satan has sent to try and deviate us from God's will for our life. Jesus said, do not let anybody, if, if it's your mother, if it's your father, if it's your, your, your brother, whoever it is, if it's a friend, do not let anybody take that crown from you. God has already crowned you. Do not let anybody take that crown for you because it's not worth it. It's really, really not worth it. But God had called Samson to great and wonderful things. And he traded all of that glory because of somebody that he shouldn't have been with in the first place. Look, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, let us, in this season, let us pray to God 
for this sermon. Let us pray to God that we will not fall short. Let us pray to God that we will take our calling, uh, you know, seriously. Let us pray to God that we will have favor from God. From God. Enemies out there trying to cause a pet. The enemies out there trying to cause a, 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 a noise, but we have to silence him with our works. We need to silence him with righteousness. We need to silence him. Remember, our God is bigger than any any of our enemies. Our God is for us. The Bible says, if our God be for us, who can be against us? He is for us. He is for us. Let's not give up in this race that we've started. It's a race. The Bible says, if we endure until the end, we will be saved. That means there's still work to be done in front of us. But let us put our trust in God. And let us take our high calling seriously. Amen. So um, I don't know if anybody wanted to share anything um, before, before we get into the teaching. Um, there was a few. Please, if anyone wants to share anything. Um, you know, when we, when we think about fighting for the kingdom, in Hebrews chapter 11, if we go there quickly to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, so let's read from verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So our faith is in Christ. Our faith is that Christ is the Savior of the world. Our faith is that through Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection, and finally his ascension into heaven, that by believing in that and by turning from our sins and following Christ, we believe that on that final day when Christ comes back, if we are dead in that day, Christ will raise us again from the dead and we will live and reign with Christ. That is our faith, that our sins have been blotted out because of the, the, the sacrifice of Christ. That is what we believe in and that is what is going to continue to give us strength against the enemy. So for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Okay, so all the people that came before us, all the fathers like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, all of them received a good report from God because of faith. Think of report like uh, you've, you've gone to school and at the end of each term, the teacher writes a report about you. He writes the things that are good. He writes the things that need some improvement. The Bible is here saying that we get a good report from God by believing in him. Now, my brothers and sisters, let me tell you that God sometimes tests our faith. God tests our faith. Sometimes we go through situations we don't want to go through. But God is always there watching, waiting, seeing, does this, does this my son, does this my daughter, does, do they believe? How are they going to respond? Sometimes God may even let, he doesn't tempt us. The Bible says God does not tempt us. But God may let the Satan tempt us sometimes. Like God let Satan tempt Job. And God was watching, waiting to see how is Job going to respond. My brothers and sisters, sometimes when we sin, sometimes it's actually a test. God wanted that to see how we would respond. And look, we need, to, we need to become mature now. We need to see that, look, many of the temptations that are before us, they're actually just tests from God. And God wants to see if we really have faith. Because if we really have faith in, in his word, then we'll say no to certain sins. In fact, not certain sins. We would say no to all sin. We would say no to all sin. Whatever sin, whatever temptation, we would say no to it. But let us know that as long as we're in this body, as long as we're in this earth, there is always going to be temptation. That's, that's the unfortunate thing, that every day we will be tempted with one thing or the other. But Christ said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So we need to put our trust in Christ. I'm telling you, if we just seek after Christ with 100% of our heart, then we would have dominion over all the things of the flesh. It's not easy, and it's certainly a process that God uh, puts inside of us, but we need to get to that stage where we love Christ with all of our heart, where, as we read in, in Matthew 6, 33, our priority is seeking the kingdom of God, seeking righteousness, 
okay? Be, wanting to be a good person, wanting to be a kind, a loving person, wanting to emulate Christ in all things. Sometimes we have to sit down and say, okay, how would Christ respond in this situation? Am I not called a Christian? Am I not called to be a follower of Christ? And in reflecting, whenever you make a decision and you say, oh, Christ wouldn't have done that, then we confess our sins. And the Bible says God is just and faithful to, 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 to cleanse us, uh, to forgive us from our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look, my brothers and sisters, I'm here to, to encourage you today that God is real. God is real. And God's word is real. And if God said he's going to do something good in our lives, I'm telling you, he's going to do it. It's only a matter of time. We're almost there. We're almost there. I'm not saying we're going to, to die soon. That's not God's will for us. But let me tell you that we're almost ready to enter into God's kingdom. We're almost there. We just need to continue to have faith in Jesus. <coughs> we need to continue to have faith in the word of God. And by the time you know it, we'll be in God's kingdom. You know, the Bible says that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Oh, wow. Nor has it been revealed to the sons of men, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Heaven is going to be wonderful. Heaven, this is not our home. This, the Bible says that we are pilgrims. We are taking a journey. We're here for an experience. We're, he we're here for salvation. We're here to, to, to be a light to the world. We're here to, to bring other people into truth, to teach them what God has taught us. That's why we're here. And when the Bible says that Christ, he didn't, Christ was, you know, he was, he, he hated the shame that he experienced here and he was hungry to be with the Father. Paul said that, uh, that, I, that I, I, I'm in a, a crossroads. I don't know whether to stay with you. The disciples, he was like, I don't know whether to stay with the disciples or I don't know whether to go and be with Christ. He said he'd rather be with Christ. But he said that it was important for him to be with the disciples to help them. Look, I'm telling you, I'm not saying that we should, we should be so heavenly minded that all we want to do is go to heaven and we forget about the responsibilities that we have here. Because some of us have responsibilities. Some of us have responsibilities with family. Some of us have responsibilities with work. But what I think Christ is saying is that none of these things mean as much as entering into the into the kingdom of god so our attention our heart should be on the kingdom of god when we wake up in the morning what we should be thinking about is what can i do to please the lord today what is it or we should be saying what is it that's in my life that i need to remove from my life that's preventing me from maybe getting into the kingdom of god it might be a person it might be a relationship it might be somebody's somebody's deviating you away from the will of God for your life. And that's where we have to pray and say, God, look, if there's anybody in my life that you don't want to be in my life, Father, take them out of my life. I'm, I'm, I would much rather please you than please man. Okay? Because you see, the Bible is very clear. It says so many times that lean not onto your own understanding. It, trust in the Lord with all thine hearts. We, the Bible says trust in the Lord. doesn't mean we shouldn't trust in brothers and sisters. There's some brothers and sisters that can help us. But none of us died for each other. I Paul didn't die for us. None of our pastors died for us. Only Christ died for us. So if there's somebody that we should be looking for on a day-to-day -day basis, it's Christ. And what I love about our faith is that our faith comes with power. Paul said, I didn't come to you with fancy words and eloquent words. I, I came to you in a demonstration of power by the Holy Ghost. And what I love about Christ is that Christ has shown us that he is real by the spirit of God that he's given us. In, in first epistle of John, uh, chapter five, it says that we know that we are the children of God because of the spirit that he's put inside of us. So none of us should doubt a, a, a Christ. None of us should doubt whether we're the children of God because God has given us his Holy Spirit. So he's definitely there and he's definitely with us. But God, what God wants us to do is to turn to him and look, my friends, this is how we turn to God. We turn to God with our hearts, with our hearts. It's not necessarily with our mouth. In Matthew 15, Jesus said, let's go to Matthew 15. Talking about the Pharisees. And I think the Pharisees are a good 
symbol for, for religious people, people that believe in God, but they rely on their own works. Verses, um, let's read from verse 7. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw near unto me with their mouth, and honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Amen. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the man, this defiles a man. So Christ is saying that there's a difference between praising him and there's a difference between actually loving him. We can praise him, we can say we believe in God, we can quote scripture from today to tomorrow, but what, how is our heart like? Is our, are we close to God? Are we close to God? That is what God wants us to be. God wants us to, because when, we, when we're close to God, we won't lose our salvation, I'm telling you. When we're close to God, and I know I'm not saying that, okay, just by saying a prayer, you're saved, and you don't need to work at your, your own salvation or prayer and training. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that you can get so close to God, you become God's friend, like Abraham. When I look at the life of Abraham, I don't think of somebody that could have lost his salvation because yeah. Abraham was so close to God. Mm. Abraham, as I, I was talking about idols, but if you look at the life of Abraham, God is always trying to deal with idols in Abraham's heart. What separated Abraham from the people of his time is that Abraham didn't follow idols. In those times, Abraham's father, for instance, was an idolater. But Abraham's father used to make metals and he used to worship the, the, the metals. He used to worship the gods that he made. And Abraham stood up and was like, I'm not going to follow my father's ways. I'm going to follow the, the one God. God told him, the first, one of the first commandments we heard from God to Abraham, God said to Abraham, leave your, your family. Leave them and come to this land, I will show you. Abraham eventually listened. When Abraham got into, into Israel, God gave him more instructions. God had a, uh, Abraham had a child called Ishmael, and from his second wife, from uh, Hagar. Hagar, I think her name was, yeah. And God, when Ishmael was older, God told uh, Abraham, send away Ishmael, send away uh, Hagar. And Abraham was sad. It was almost like the, the child had become an idol in his heart, but Abraham obeyed. When, when Isaac was older, God said to, to Abraham, take up your son, the son that you love, the son that had become like an idol in Abraham's heart. It's like Abraham had been thinking more about Isaac than he'd been thinking about God. It's like Abraham had been spending more time with Isaac than, than he had been spending with God. Should we not spend time with our family? We should spend time with our family 100%. But if we're spending so much time with people around us and then we're neglecting prayer, we're neglecting the Bible, then God will tell us to sacrifice those things because those things, they cannot save us. The only thing that can save us is the presence of God. That's why it's not because God is an egotistical God that he needs us to bow down and worship him all, to, all the time. God has angels that do that. The stars worship God. The, the wind worships God. The sea worships God. Everything worships God in creation. The, the animals, they worship God. It's not because of that. It's because we need to be in the presence of God for salvation. Because without the presence of God, there is no good thing that dwells inside of us. Without the presence of God, we will, we will turn our backs from God. How do we turn our backs from God? Just like the Pharisees, we can be drawing near to him with our mouths, praising him with our mouths, but our heart can be far from him. Our heart can be cold. Our, we, we, may no long, we may go to church and sing praise and hallelujah and clap our hands, but our heart could be far from him. And when our heart is far from him, it will tell, it will show. We might not see it, but God sees it and it will tell. It may not necessarily be obvious sin. And when I, by obvious sin, I mean those big sins that we all know. It might be little things like having unforgiveness. It might be those things like uh, having malice. Somebody's hurt you and you now you, you want evil to, to befall them. It may be envy. It may be little things like that. 
And those are things that if you're in the presence of God, that, can, that can't come in your heart. That can't. It might be little things like now you're prioritizing work. You're spending so many hours working, you don't have time to work for God. You don't have time to pray to God. You don't have time to just relax, to rest in his presence. Those are the things that happen when we stray away from the presence of God. And a little bit, by, little by little, when Satan is watching, the Bible calls Satan a serpent. And if you watch serpents, serpents can wait for hours in the wilderness, waiting for the right time to pounce upon the prey, to eat, to eat the prey. They don't move, they stay solitary. They stay stationary and solitary in the wilderness, just waiting for the exact time, the precise time to pounce. That's how Satan is like. Satan watches. Satan sends familiar spirits. These are, these are evil spirits that have been walking with us, watching us, monitoring us since we were born. They've been monitoring our ancestors. They know everything about us. They know our, they, well, they don't know everything about us, but they know our weaknesses. They can watch our moves. But when we're under the tabernacle, when we're in the tabernacle of God, the Bible calls it in Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of, his, of the Almighty. When we're in the secret place, they can't see us anymore. When we're, in the, when we're close to God, they can't monitor us anymore. Because the Bible says God will send, uh, he, he will send his angels to, to, to have charge over us. Yeah. As we dash off against the stone. So they ain't, when we're close to God, Bible says the angel of the Lord encampeth around those that fear him. When we're close to God, God sends angels to us to protect us and to fight for us. But when we're far from God, there's angels are not there for us. Then that's why those, those evil spirits, they'll be battering you. They'll be making you depressed. They'll be making you ill. They'll be making you sad because you're, you've strayed far from God. And the, the sad thing is that even earlier on, I was thinking that it's so easy to stray from God and we wouldn't know it because some of us, we have gifts of the spirit and we use them. And the gifts of the spirit is not the same as the presence of God. The gift, God if, you, if God has given you a gift, you, you always have that gift. The Bible says the gifts of God come without repentance. That means if God has made you, has given you a prophetic gift, even if you start living in sin and you, you turn away from God, you can still prophesy. You're, if God has given you a teacher anointed, you can be far from God. Don't pray. You don't seek him, you don't fast, but you can still, when, you, when you're given a, a microphone and you're given a platform, you can still teach and the anointing will come and everybody will be thinking, wow, mighty man of God, without knowing that this person has strayed away from God for a long time, for a long time. And that is what happened to Samson. Samson, he started off good. He's, he was close to God when he was young. As he got older, as he got comfortable, his heart started to turn away from God. When Delilah came, to attack him he said i will go up as i did before but then the bible says he did not know that the spirit of god had left him he thought that god was still with him but god had gone why had god gone because he had gone he had gone it's not because god is a wicked god god is always available for us but are we going to him are we going to him if if you're if you're a man here and your wife decides to leave you are you going to beg her to come back you may, for a day or two, but eventually you say, you know what? If she wants to leave, let her leave. If she wants to come back, maybe I'll accept her. And that's how God is like with us. When we leave, if we leave his presence, God grieves. The spirit of God is grieved. That means he gets upset, he gets sad. He, he, he will do everything in his power to bring us back in. He will send, he will send prophets. He will give you dreams. He will speak to you and... and you, you even feel it in your spirit. You'll feel like you're lost. You'll feel like you're empty. You'll feel like everything that you're doing around you is not adding up. That's God calling you back home, calling you back to his presence. But if we say no, what can God do? God can't do anything. He can't force us to come back. All he does is he's very gentle. He gives us time. He's very patient. He gives us time to do our own thing. Remember, the story of the, the prodigal son. He was a son. The father gave him a big inheritance. He then squandered the inheritance, went away, said that he was drinking. He was spending time, you know, around, you know, <laughs> around women, wasting the inheritance. And the father left him. The father didn't say, oh, let me go and find him. Where's my son? 
The Father gave him freedom. God gives us freedom. God gives us free will. We can decide what we want. When the, 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 the famine came upon the land, the, the Bible says that the son came back to his senses and he went back to the father. The moment the father saw him coming back, he ran to him. He embraced him. He gave him presents. He, set, he had a party for him. Jesus said that, that uh, when, when the, the one lost sheep is found, that when there's a one lost sheep, Christ will leave 99 to find the one. And that when that one is found, then there's great rejoicing. Do you know that one is somebody that was already saved? Do you know that? It's not somebody that wasn't saved. Sheep is, is talking about the saints. Sheep is talking about those who are Christians. So if one went astray, that means that one was once a Christian. He went astray like the prodigal son. He went astray and did his own thing. But the Bible says when he comes back, you know, when he comes back, there's not condemnation. When he comes back, the, the shepherd isn't whipping him and saying, why did you run away? What's wrong with you? When he comes back, there's love. When the prodigal son came back, the father, the father didn't say, oh, why did you waste all my, uh, my inheritance? No, the father was accepting of him and was happy. That's how God is when we come back to him. He rejoices, he smiles, he gets happy, he talks to the angels. The angels rejoice and dance. They get happy. They're like, yes, he's back on track. Finally, that God rejoices when we decide, you know what? I'm not doing 95% God, 5% world. I'm not doing 95% God, 5% my girlfriend. I'm doing 100% God. Anybody else, <laughs> you can decide, can decide you know, what you want, but I know what I've decided. I'm following Jesus. I'm for, only, only, only us can understand and only us can know when that day happens. There's, tr trust me, you can be saved, come to Christ, and get baptized in the name of Jesus, and be just, you know, being discipled, going out there, doing the work of God, and yet your heart is still not 100%. You know, God wants 100% of your heart. 100% of your heart. And when God has 100% of your heart, do you know what God is going to tell you to do? He's going to tell you to do, I believe, what God told, or what Christ told Peter to do. And Christ asked Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes. He said, feed my sheep. He said, do you love me? He said, yes. Christ said, feed my sheep. Look, mm -hmm. when we're 100% for God, I'm telling you, it will manifest in our ability to just want to teach people the word of God to teach people the word of God every single day if we have to sell everything to follow Christ we will do it until that day arises where we can happily say that I don't care about this world I don't care about what it has to offer I'm not concerned about this or that that the world has to offer all I'm concerned about is doing the will of Christ and following him until then then there's always a bit of space for us to improve. Now, my hope is that we're getting there. I'm not here to say that any of us have arrived. I'm not here to say that this is something God is going to do in the next year or two. I'm here to say that this is something that I believe God can do in all of our lives. And I think that we will have freedom and true liberty and joy, peace, when, we, when that day arises. And I think gradually we should be working bit by bit towards surrendering our heart towards God. Because as we, we read in Matthew 6, it says, you, you cannot have two masters. You cannot serve the Lord and serve mammon. You cannot serve the Lord and serve this world. It's only the Lord or the world. It's, there's no in between the two. There's no confusion. There's no lukewarmness when it comes to Christ. It has to be all about the Lord. And the way in which we can make this happen, because it's, the Bible says not by strength, it's not by might, it's by my spirit. The way in which we can produce this in our life is through prayer. We need, to, we need to return back to prayer and we need to keep praying to God, God, let your will be done. We need, we need to open up to God. Sometimes, sometimes we don't have the strength to do it alone, but we need to say, God, in your strength, let it be, let it be, let it be so. You can make it possible. Amen? So let's just for the last... 10 minutes. I don't want to keep you too long tonight, but for the last 10 minutes, let's just quickly get into this study. 
I'll just keep you for 10 more minutes. Amen. So uh, we're going to look at um, being a minister of the Lord. So we're all, all of us here are servants of God. Um, and let me just read through this. So God has set us free so we can serve him. Everybody who is a child of God has the responsibility of serving him in spirit and truth. God gives us talents, that is gifts of the spirit to serve him. We use these talents to edify the church and proceed in seeing the kingdom of God coming upon the earth. So if you just bear with me, I want to just show you this. So where in the last weeks we were talking about righteousness and what righteousness really means. What we saw is that some people look at faith and say that, okay, all I need to have is faith and they leave, uh, they leave it there and they feel that that's all we're called to do, just called to believe. But the Bible gives us a contrary story and the Bible teaches us that after we've believed that there is a work for us to do, we look at Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 10, it, says, it does acknowledge that we are by grace through faith. So we're not saved by our own, it says, and that not of yourselves. So we're not saved by our own strength. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus unto good works. So we've been saved and created in Jesus for good works. God has created us for good works, to do good things on the earth before we die, before we be united. Remember, Jesus has a crown. Jesus has a throne. Jesus has, has received the reward in heaven because of his good works. The Bible says that Jesus went around doing good. That is what God has called us to do, to do good, to be good. We've received grace. We've received salvation to be good. Otherwise, we would be in heaven right now. If all we needed to do was mm -hmm. believe in Jesus, then why aren't we in heaven? But we're here on the earth because God wants us to do good so that we can show his goodness. Because people won't see God unless they see God in us. People didn't see God properly until they saw God in Christ. They could see God in, in, in creation. They could see that there was a creator but they couldn't see the nature of God until they saw it in Christ. They, didn't, they couldn't see that God was love until they saw it in Christ. We, the Bible says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained that we should, we should walk in. Amen. Do you know the people in the Old Testament, Elijah, Moses, they didn't, they didn't show the world God in the same way that Jesus Christ showed the world. They showed certain dimensions of God. David showed certain dimensions of God. Abraham showed certain dimensions of God. But Jesus showed the world who God is in his fullness. Jesus showed us the love of God. Jesus showed us the patience of God. They wanted to take a woman and stone her because she didn't caught in the act of committing adultery and they said oh in the law of moses it says this and jesus said he that is without sin let him first throw the stone he was showing us the mercy of god and we who are in jesus we don't look at moses we don't look at elijah we look at christ that moses and elijah looked at christ so why would we look at moses if Moses looked at Christ, if, if Elijah looked at Christ, why should we look at Elijah? If David said, my Lord, they say, if David said, the Lord said unto my Lord, Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit, sit thou or stand thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thine footstool. Who was David speaking about? He was speaking about the Messiah. He was talking about Christ. David said, the, Lord, the most high God, said unto my Lord, who is my Lord? Christ, the Son of God. Mm. Wow. Who, who was David looking unto? David wasn't looking unto Abraham. David was looking unto Christ. Christ said, before Abraham was, I am. 
Christ said that Abraham saw this day and he was happy. He was happy when he saw this day. And who was Abraham looking on to? Abraham was looking on to Christ. So we as Christians, we look on to Christ. And we don't, we don't formulate excuses for ourselves and say, oh, because, uh, you know, the, the, because Elijah was angry, you know, I have to be angry as well. You know, because Elisha cursed them, you know, he was angry and they were making fun of him and he cursed them and, and a bear came and ate them. So let me start cursing all of my enemies. No, 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 no. We have to, I always say this, we did that when we were young. We did that before. We've changed now. We're not doing that anymore. We, we are Christians and we're learning what it really means to be a Christian. Some of us here, we're getting older in the faith now. We've been in the faith for a few years. God is looking for fruit. Remember um, the parable where, uh, uh, or not even the parable, it actually happened, where Jesus saw a fig tree and it had no fruit. And he, he rebuked it. He was angry and he rebuked it. And he was showing us there that, look, what he wants from us is fruit. He wants fruit. Okay, what we're going to look at, what's the time now? We've got about five minutes. So let's look at this, read fruit, and then we're going we're gonna to finish on this concept about fruit, because this is what God is, was uh, wants in all of our lives. Paul makes it clear that God still expects us to, to perform good works. So Brother Ezekiel, we were just talking about faith and how some people look at faith and stop at faith, but God wants us to go beyond faith. Faith is, uh, is, is what we need to be saved. But even after, even after salvation, and when we're fully saved, i.e. when we're in the kingdom of God, there's still going to be works. We're still going to be working for the Lord. The Bible says that we're going to be teaching people in the world about the ways of the Lord. The Bible says that we'll be, we'll be judging. So do you not know you will judge angels? This is, after, this is after we've been fully saved, after our body has been redeemed. So there's, there's going to be work for us to do. Jesus said, I mean, we're reading here, so Jesus said, my father worketh hitherto and I work. He said, my father work hitherto and I work. Jesus was on the earth for work. Die <laughs> until he completed it. So we have work. And do you know what the devil does? The devil does as many things as possible to prevent us from this work. He afflicts us. He sends evil people to us. Some, some of you have had bad experiences with people. You don't know if Satan sent them to you. Satan sent those people to you to, to, to prevent you from doing the work of God. There are people like that that Satan sends. Some of us, sickness, Satan afflicting us because he doesn't want us to do the work. He doesn't want us to do the work. Some of us get distracted. Some of us, we're always sleeping. Why? Because Satan doesn't want us to work. Wow. He doesn't want us to work. It says, if faith was all that Jesus wanted us to have, then didn't, then that should be, why didn't he just rapture us into heaven? The moment we were baptized and professed our faith in Christ. And when we were baptized, Christ should have just raptured us. At least when we were baptized, we were pure, we were clean. We didn't have any sin. We were so innocent in the faith. We were happy for the Lord. That would have been the best time, wouldn't it? For Christ to be like, yes, my son, come. Well done. But no, he didn't. He left us on the earth. This is because there is still work to be done. Jesus said, my father work hitherto and I work. It is often said that faith without, without works is dead. Okay. Is it James that said faith without works is dead? Another way of looking at it is by saying faith without fruit is dead. Okay, what, what that means, what James was saying is that how can you say you have faith and you're not doing the works of God? Even Jesus said that. He said, believe me or believe the works. In fact, that's, that's, let me get that scripture up. Let me see if I can find it. Jesus, Jesus said, believe me or believe me for the work's sake. Believe me for the works. John chapter 14, verse 11. John 14, verses 11. 
said to leave me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work, for the very work. Amen. So this, this is it, you know, our, our, us getting people into Christ, as much as I enjoy evangelism, a more powerful way for us to get into Christ is to show good, uh, to get people to come to Christ, is to show them our good works. Christ was telling the disciples, he said, okay, you, you guys, you have doubt. You don't really believe in me, but you should at least believe me for the works I've done. You should believe me for what I've done, the miracles, for, 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 for the times I've been teaching you day in, day out, consistently, for the times I've been kind to you, for the times I've been loving to you, for the times you've seen me with, with women that have been rejected by society and I'm giving them love. I'm teaching them. I'm being there for them. You see me raise the dead. You see me multiply bread and fish. So believe me for the work. So our, our testimony will become believable through our works. Through our works. Though we all have faith, this faith is meaningless, or dare I say void, if there is no fruit to show. So if we're saying, oh, I have faith, but we're living a life of the faithless, then that faith should be questioned. That faith will not give us a reward. We won't be able to say to God, oh, I've got faith. Therefore, let me enter into the kingdom of God because Christ said many will come to me in that day. And all those people that came to him in that day had faith because they said, I cast out devils in your name. I did these wonderful works in your name. So they had faith, but they lacked works. I think we can see the connection between faith and works. Then James is not saying that we are saved by works. James is saying we are saved by faith. But he's saying that there needs to be obedience from that faith. And a big part of that obedience is working for God, be it serving God, obeying what God has said in the word, but then also walking in, in the own assignment that God has given us, because God has a specific assignment for us. And that's why Going back to what I said about the presence of God, that is why it's so important for us to return back to his presence. And I know it might not be something we can just do overnight. It's not something that we can just say, we're going to find out everything today because we see in part and know in part. But it's something that we can start today. And when God sees that we are in it for him, then God can respond speedily. There's no, there's no way about it. There's no way of saying, okay, God appeared to Daniel in 21 days. So I have to do 21 days and God will appear on 21st day. God can appear tonight. God can appear tomorrow, but God wants to just see that, look, let's, we want to serve him in any way we can. In any way, we don't have to do it, you know, worldwide. It could just be locally, any way that we can. God will give us peace. The Bible says the peace that surpasses all understanding. When you lose that peace in your heart and you, you're, you're wild up in your spirit, I think that's God saying, come back. I think that's God saying, there's more to you than what you're showing I think that's God saying, look, I've called you to be a prophet. I've called you to be a, a minister. I've called you to be a priest. Come back to me and I will anoint you. So fruit. So if we look at John 15 verses 8, let's just finish this now. It says, Jesus said, herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Fruit can refer to one of two things, your character and then your ministry as well. So when, when God is saying, when Jesus is saying bear much fruit, he's talking about our character, number one, the fruit of the spirit. But he's also talking about our, our work in the ministry, what we're doing to serve God. There are different levels of fruit. Jesus said of the seed sown onto the ground, others fell onto good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundred, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was, which was with me. So Paul understood the importance of bearing fruit, of working, working for God, working for God. And it starts little by little, it starts by prayer, it starts by interceding for others, okay? But then it, we also need to pay attention to our character. We need to, 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 to invest time into becoming a better person. We need to be humble, put up our hands, you know, God, God, so long we're humble, God is fine. We make a mistake, put up our hands, say, God, look, I messed up. God is, gonna, God is fine. God is fine. God is, but when we, when we don't fess up, that's when God cannot really help us develop that character. Okay, so we have to reflect. Look, today I did this. Today I said that. 
God will help us and God will, will, will find us in Jesus' name. Amen. So just going to close now in prayer. Um, praise God. Um, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the study. We just pray, Lord God, that every one of us here would bear fruit, uh, even unto a level everlasting life. And Father, we pray that we would return to your presence, that we would we would seek you like there's no tomorrow. Father, we pray that we would all dwell in a secret place. We pray, Father, that your grace would more, be multiplied in our lives. I pray, Father God, that your knowledge of, of your son Christ will be multiplied in our lives. We pray, Father God, that we will serve you all our days, that we will serve you in spirit and in truth. And Father God, we just pray for favor with you and with men. We pray, Lord God, that you would favor us extraordinarily. And we just pray, Father, that you would lead us by your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord God, that you will give us discernment. I pray, Lord God, that you will give us strength, Lord God, in this season. Father God, I pray, Lord God, that this will be a positive season that we're all entering into, that this will be a season, Lord God, of your peace, of your shalom. Father God, we just bless you and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. We thank you, Lord God, for this time of fellowship. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys, for coming. Good night. Amen. Love, guys. Bye.